Hi there, I'm Jane and welcome to my YouTube channel and my less messy than usual sewing corner. I'm really happy you're here and that you decided to join me today. First off, let me tell you a secret. And yes, I'm looking at my script because I, my memory is nothing, so I need it. Thank you. The first step to making sure you have a beautiful historical costume isn't really like the right fabric or, you know, the sewing techniques or even the research. Controversial, I know. It's actually having the right underwear, the historical Spanx, if you will. And that's why today I'm showing you how I sewed up this pair of 18th century stays. I used the 1780s, oh god, what is it called? Front lacing stays PDF pattern from Red Threaded. Red Threaded, as in like the color red and then thread and then past tense. I'll include the link to their website in the description, so if you want to find out more about them, go right on ahead. I've actually made their Regency stays before in the past, and they turned out super well, and I think they make really great and pretty reasonably priced historical patterns. So some quick information before we jump in and get started. Number one, this pattern is meant for machine sewing, but I did not do that. Number two, I'm using a few layers of fabric instead of only two as the pattern kind of calls for. This is because extant pairs of stays typically seem to have more than two layers of fabric, as well as a lining that's attached at the very end of the process, not like sewn on like a modern lining. And number three, these stays would be considered half-boned for the period. And some nitpicky stuff as well, just real, real quick, just for me. So I know that this hair and makeup looks straight out of the 60s, and that is because one, I do not think I am capable of doing thin eyeliner. I don't know why, I think I've done it before, but I've never, like maybe once, but I've never been able to like recapture that. And the hair is, so the 18th century has very sculptural hairstyles that are like often tall and basically put over pads, like the bumpets that we all grew up with, probably. So I didn't feel like doing that, especially for something about stays. Uh, there's not even a gown involved here. So I just sort of did something 18th century inspired that I could do with a hair clip and some bobby pins because if I did my hair the, r the right way, it's costuming, I do it for fun, there's really no right way. But if I did it the historically correct way, I don't think this video would have ever got gotten actually like made because it was already challenging enough to, you know, make it, edit it, do all the stuff. I didn't have it in me to curl my hair, my very, very straight hair. So anyways, now that I've said my piece, let's just go on to the video before I start embarrassing myself. I kind of love assembling printed home sewing patterns. It's like putting a puzzle together. And for smaller projects like stays, it's really easy to do because there's only a few pieces. The pattern pieces are then cut out and taped together. I prefer to use clear tape to hold everything together because it's strong enough for paper and I can still see all the pattern markings, but I also sometimes use drafting tape because it won't tear the paper if I remove it. I definitely recommend clear tape over this kind though. After I have all the paper pattern pieces, I'll start the process of cutting out the fabric. This was major indecision time for me. I originally planned on using a pretty mint colored jacquard I have in my stash, but then decided to use a purple linen instead. I read somewhere online to try starching linen fabric before cutting it to make the process much easier and wow, I love this. It works so well. Linen has a sort of wobbly quality to it and starching the fabric made it much more stable and gave me so much more precise pattern pieces. I 10 out of 10 recommend this 100%. For the other layers of fabric, I have a cotton twill and a layer of muslin. I was also going to use a loosely woven linen for a lining, but decided to go a different route with my lining technique, so it's later swapped out for something else. Each paper pattern piece is laid out and traced around with tailor's chalk, and then cut out along the trace markings. I use these bottles of perfume as pattern weights because I don't want to pay for or make actual proper pattern weights, but it's fine. I added the extra pattern markings and boning channel placements after cutting the pieces out, and I did that with pencil because it's thinner and more precise. And also, I'm chopping up the little scraps 
left over into bits to use them as stuffing for things like bum rolls and false rumps. This helps with the environmental impact of sewing because it creates a closed studio practice, whereas much of my scraps are reused instead of thrown away. I also just like collecting colorful things in jars because I'm a bit of a magpie. Before I can start the long undertaking of hand sewing all the boning channels, I have to baste each piece together to prevent the layers shifting as I work. So each piece gets pinned together and basted through the middle while avoiding the marked out boning channels. I left the muslin layer with a generous seam allowance, but any extra will get trimmed off later on, so it's not a big deal. However, I'm leaving the lining alone for now. I'll get more into why it's kept separate until the end when I actually attach it then. Also, as the pattern calls for, I'm going to stay stitch the tabs on the bottom edge to prevent them from distorting as I sew. I'm doing this with a back stitch and some thinner cotton thread. Another thing the pattern calls for is for the front and side pieces to be sewn together before the boning channels are started, because this seam also marks out one of the boning channels. So I'm back stitching this together with a violet quilting thread and the tiniest stitches I can manage with all these fabric layers. All main construction seams will be sewn like this with this thread. Now that everything is basted and stay stitched, I can start sewing the boning channels. While it would be far smarter and faster to do this on my sewing machine, I am foolish and enjoy hand sewing a little too much for my own good. I'm using a white cotton quilting thread to sew two parallel lines everywhere the pattern calls for boning. While this section is only a small portion of the video, in real life this took hours. If you're into sewing this kind of thing, don't be like me. Use your sewing machine. Or if you're gonna be like me, find a really good show to binge watch while you do this, like I did. After the boning channels are done, I'm trimming off some of the extra fabric around the edges. One little thing before we move on to the next step. Somehow, the boning channels didn't quite match on the two front pieces. I have no idea what happened. I marked them all out with a tracing wheel to be as precise as possible, but I guess the cards just weren't in my favor for this. I'm using synthetic whalebone for this, which is pretty cheap and does a great job of making a comfortable garment. However, it does have to be filed and cut, and it is sturdy, so it is a laborious process. Each piece is marked and then cut off the main roll. Then I trim the corners and file the edges down with a nail file, which takes forever. It's honestly the best practice to use a Dremel for filing the edges, but I don't have one. However, my fiancé said I could borrow his jewelry making files for the next bone project I make, which should help a ton. Once that's done, I iron them on a low heat setting for a couple minutes to flatten them out. After the bones are prepared, they're inserted into the channels. I chose to have the bones with the linen and muslin layers on one side and the cotton twill on the other. Once I add the lining, there should be two layers of fabric on each side of the bones. What I should have done here to make this easier for myself, because it got kind of confusing, is label each boning channel on the pattern piece and then label each piece of boning with like a sharpie or whatever so that I didn't get confused of which one goes where. I figured it out in the end, but it, it took a while. That, that would have been an easier way to do it. Now the bottom edge tabs are cut out. I probably should have waited until after I did the first step of binding, but this is just what made sense to me at the time. Before binding the top edge, I whip stitched the layers together inside the seam allowance with the same purple thread I used for basting. This step just helps with keeping the layers stable and provides an extra obstacle for boning that wants to try to escape. Hello, it is me reporting live from my sewing corner. And while I have the pieces of my stays. Look, look, they're all even cut out at the bottom. Boning channels are sewn, ready to go. <laughs> um, I unfortunately realized that. Oh gosh, where did I put it? Um, this was the bias tape I had bought. And this bias tape, unfortunately, is half an inch wide. So I had to go to Joanne's and buy some more bias tape that would work better. And I got some wider stuff in the same color. Just um, 
Yeah, same color, just uh, wider. Because I think I could have made this one work, but it was really... It would have been a very thin bound edge, which isn't quite the look I was going for. So, this should be better. Um, yeah, sometimes you just have to take a little step back from your project and go get more stuff because you bought the wrong stuff. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. While it would be the most historically accurate to bind the stays in a thin leather, I don't want to hunt it down in a store or inevitably hurt my hands with this method. So I'm using bias tape, but I chose a color that evokes the idea of leather. Once I had the correct bias tape for this project, I tried to bind the bottom edge like I normally would on something, with one side of the bias tape unfolded, and then folded around the back once attached. However, this was really finicky to do for this project, and it ended up looking really horrible after the back side was stitched down. So instead of the method I just described, I decided to apply it on the front side using half of the bias tape, folded in half, with like two of the edges, it's hard to verbally explain. And I did that with a running back stitch, and then whip stitch the other half of the bias tape down as normal. This ended up being quicker, easier, and looking far smoother than the first method I tried. With the bottom edge of each piece bound, the back pieces are sewn together. I definitely did this a little wonky the first time and had to re-sew the seam. Then each side slash front piece is sewn to the respective back piece and the construction is all finished. While the original sewing pattern has markings for cross-lacing, aka the lacing you see on a lot of mass-made garments and modern stuff, I'm much more familiar with spiral lacing and I prefer the simplicity of it. Spiral lacing is also far more historically accurate. So for this lacing method, I'll mark out the eyelets on the front, space one inch apart, except for the top and bottom pairs of eyelets, which are half that. This ensures that the sides meet together evenly instead of shifting up or down. I also have to decide which color thread to use for the eyelets. I think it would look nice for the eyelets to match the binding, especially because I couldn't find any threads suitable for eyelets in the same shade of purple as the fabric. Each eyelet is made by wiggling an awl between the threads of the fabric, then stretching the area out. A few running stitches around the eyelet mark where the whip stitches will go, and then I make whip stitches pretty heavily around the circumference. While you can use far fewer stitches than I do, I prefer to make my hand-sewn eyelets really sturdy with as many whip stitches as it takes to cover all of the edges. After the front edge eyelets are all finished, I'm binding the top edge the same way I did the bottom edge. The shoulder straps for this pair of stays are done separately, with all the layers basted together and then bound, except for the bottom edge. An eyelid is added to the top edge, a lining piece is whip stitch on, the bottom edge is quickly overlocked, and finally they're sewn onto the inside of the garment along the back shoulder. There's also a matching eyelet added to the peak of the bust on both sides of the front of the stays so that the straps can be tied to the front edge and adjusted as necessary. When I started this project, I did some research into 18th century stays and how other delightful customers have made theirs. One video with Abby Cox and Lauren Stowell was particularly helpful, and it detailed how they used wide twill tape instead of straps. I really love this idea, but I would have had to special order wide twill tape and wait around for it to show up. I'm really impatient, so I just made the straps for the moment. 
The nice thing is that I can always cut them off and use the twill tape instead if I want to try something different. So I didn't end up using the lining I had cut out earlier. I made some miscalculations. If I had used the pieces I cut out in the shape of each pattern piece, I would have had to whip stitch each piece down. Instead, I laid out some white cotton fabric and laid the stays down on top, then traced the entire garment out. The lining piece was cut out with a 1 inch seam allowance, and then the lining seam allowance was folded in and whip stitched onto the stays. I suppose I could have also done the math and removed the seam allowance from each piece of the lining to match exactly, but it seemed easier to just go with a different strategy. I mean, that's, that's it. That's what I did. Here are the stays. They're currently laced up with leftover acrylic yarn because I have not gotten around to making a cord or buying a cord to lace them up with yet, but this works fine. Have them on over a Regency shift I had <laughs> lying around. I also have oh, a petticoat. So, you know, little under petticoat. This is what I got. Oh gosh, I'm really tall. So consider this the final reveal. It, it really hurts to stand like this, but yeah, I'm tall, so okay, okay, I'm going back up. Ow. So this is how it turned out. I, I kind of love them. I love the color. They're linen, so they should be very comfortable in summer. The pattern also came with a stomacher that I didn't end up actually making, which is something that you stick behind the lacing, and it sort of smooths it out over <laughs> so that your clothes don't wrinkle or get bumpy, but oh gosh, it's, I actually haven't seen the silhouette. I'm standing as straight as I possibly can. This is interesting for me. I, I feel very smooth, cubist even. <laughs> yeah, so it's like slightly limiting when it comes to breath, but it's not too bad at all. Honestly, so much better than a modern bra. I'm gonna sit now. Thanks. Thanks for letting me sit. You're a good, you're a good person. Good pal. Definitely better than a modern bra because the pressure and the constriction is divided across the entire surface area of your torso instead of like two itty bitty inches. So I should probably let them out a little bit actually, but it's, you know, I'll do that later. I'm okay. I'm not dying. I promise. I have been wearing them intermittently to try to break them in a little. They are by no means tight laced. Like I can breathe just fine, probably even better than with a modern bra. And you know, there is some pressure on the front, but it's it's more like a like a thunder jacket <laughs> than or like a weighted blanket than like I I don't feel like a sausage. I feel very comfortable. I'm actually I'm gonna rotate. I'm sitting up very, very straight. And my posture is horrible. I sit like a shrimp. So this is actually probably very beneficial for me. This is not the correct shift to wear, but I'm gonna work on that. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead, give it a little like, a little comment maybe, go ahead and subscribe, ring that little bell down there. I only post like once a month, so I won't be blowing up your notifications or anything. If you wanna show a little extra appreciation, you can go ahead and buy me a coffee on Ko-Fi, which is in the, it's down there in the description. For the rest of my 18th century wardrobe, I will be moving on to side hoops next, fancy petticoat, and then a whole silk sack back gown. And if you want a little preview, she's sitting over there, that fabric roll, that one, yeah, that's going to be it, hopefully, if I do everything right, or at least good enough. I also have some more Tudor or Elizabethan stuff coming soon. I have a pair of bodies, which is the precursor to this garment, that will be out soon as when they're, you know, finished. Right now I do my best to upload on the third Friday of every month. However, I know I was a little bit late this month, just a few days, but I have a very good reason. And my dad signed an excuse slip and everything's fine. So I had a birthday. I turned 24 on Wednesday. The week before that, my dad got married. So I was busy, but I'm glad I could have gotten this out still. Yeah, most, it's mostly on time. It's very close. It's only a few days off. It's fine. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye!